welcome to my youtube channel where we are going to solve an interesting question under the dust and rotations so this question can come in two ways sometimes they can be like they can give you the masses sometimes they're going to give you the weight of the two things so like for today we have to look at the one which is having the masses we have a mass of a ladder which is 20 kgs and the mass of an electrician who is trying to climb to climb the ladder having a mass of 60 kgs now since the ladder is uniform what are we supposed to understand the most and what are they trying to ask us they're saying we need to know the distance to which the electrician is going to climb for him to make the ladder slide so in this case if we try to draw a free body diagram of what is happening it has to look like this remember they're saying the ladder is having a length of six meters so since we have a length of six meters our thing now is going to be like this so always the weight of the ladder has to appear in the middle meaning that its weight is going to be pointing vertically downward at this point so it has to point like this say w1 why am i labeling it as w1 is because we are going to have a ladder i mean the mass of the ladder as, as well as the mass of an electrician so the mass of an electrician you can either put it before the weight of the ladder or you can put it ahead of the weight of the ladder let me try to put it somewhere there do this then you label this one to be your weight two that is the weight of an electrician remember they're saying the length of the ladder it has to be six meters so this is going to be six meters meaning that since we are saying the, the the ladder is uniform and its weight has to appear in the middle meaning that starting from this point to where the weight of the ladder is going to appear the length has to be half of six which is going to be three meters now the the length starting from here up to where an electrician is going to make the ladder slide this one is going to be labeled with any letter in this case i'll label it as x so we need to know the forces that act at this point remember the floor is having a, a friction force in this part we don't have friction force so we need to know the forces that are going to be acting on this point at the same time the formulas that we are going to be using so since the ladder is uniform there is a static friction meaning that we need to understand that the summation of forces in x axis must always be the same as the summation of forces in the y axis so we are going to to use two different um methods for us to understand what is going to be happening here remember down there that's where we are going to have the normal force pointing perpendicular to the direction of the friction force we know that if the ladder is to slide it has to move in this direction and the friction force is going to be moving in the opposite direction so here my friction force is going to be pointing in this direction and yet the ladder can slide in that given direction okay so if i'm to draw the free body diagram it has to look like this to draw a free body diagram for this has to be like this so here we are going to have a normal force from the wall at the same time we're going to have a normal force again on the ground so my normal force here has to be n1 then the normal force from the wall i'll take it as n2 so your friction force is going to be pointing in this direction i'll say friction then we are going to have of 53 degrees at this point so we are saying the weight the first weight which is the weight of the ladder i'll take it as m1 g and the second weight i'll take it as m2 g so using um the conditions of equilibrium we are saying the summation of forces in the x-axis are supposed to be balanced the summation of forces in the y-axis is supposed to be balanced also at the same time the summation of anti-clockwise torque has to be equal to the summation of clockwise summation of clockwise torque all right now how many forces do you have in the x-axis so if you check properly we are going to have this friction force which is moving to the right hand side due to the fact that we have a normal force somewhere there we also have the normal which is pointing to the left hand side meaning that friction in this case has to be equal to the normal force which is n2 I'll label this one to be my first um, equation if i come to this part 
or before I come to the summation of forces in the y-axis, let me try to understand what is happening. Friction always, friction force has to be equal to what the coefficient of friction multiplied by the specific normal force, which is the one perpendicular to the direction of friction force, N1. So I'll take this one to be my second equation. If you analyze it properly, friction force we are saying is equal to that. At the same time, friction force is equal to that. This actually simply means N2 is going to be equal to mu N1. If you come on this part, the summation of forces in the y-axis, we have three forces that are pointing in the y-axis. We have this force, we have these two forces, meaning that N1 here has to be equal to M1 G plus M2 G. So it's possible you can find your N1 for you to get N2 also. It's possible you can find your N1. How are we going to get our N1? We have M1, which is 20. We also have M2, which is 60. And G is common. They're saying we need to take it as 10 um, meters per second square. So my N1 in this case has to be equal to, I'll say G, open M1 plus M2. Then N1 has to be equal to 10, open. So if you say 20 plus 60, it will give you something like uh, 800 newtons. That has to be your N1. If you come to this part, we know what this one is, 0 0.55, and we know what N1 is. Then you just have to replace so it's 0 0.55 multiplied by 800. Then N2 has to be equal to calculators are used in this case. So 0 0.55 multiplied by 800. We are getting our answer as 440 newtons. That is for N2. That is for N2. If you come to the issue of torques, we need to understand that for us to create a moment or a torque, a force has to be perpendicular to the displacement or rather distance from the pivot. This is considered to be my pivot. Starting from this point to whichever side you can have, all the forces that, that are going to be acting on the rule or create a torque based on that direction. So since we have this weight, that one, and the normal, these forces are not even perpendicular to the displacement. The displacement or distance, we mean the length of the rule. So for us to make this one be perpendicular to the length of the row, which is 3 meters from here up somewhere there, like what I've done there, we need to resolve this one into its component. One component is going to be facing inside, or it has to be pointing inside the row. One component is going to be perpendicular now to the displacement, which is going to be M1, G, I'll say cos 53 degrees. Some applies to this part, we need to resolve it. It has to make a perpendicular thing but remember the distance from here up to the second weight we consider it as our x we don't know what that distance is and we are going to label it as the m2 g cos 53 degrees so when using the torques what we always do is we need to write it in a proper way following the same formulas for moment we understand that a torque has to be equal to force multiplied by the distance so if you check properly, what is this force? We mean the forces that are making the torque, I mean that are making the rule move. If we understand properly, this one can also be resolved. One is going to be facing in this direction and one is going to be perpendicular now to, to the length. So since we have 53 here, we can also have 53, meaning that one component which is going to be inside, we don't even care about the same components. Why? Because they won't produce any torque. They're moving along the row. Then the component which is inside will carry cos. It has to carry cosine, an identity of cosine. The one which is going to be moving in this direction, we we'll label it as N2 sine 53 degrees. Now, Let's try to finish our calculations based on this. If we are using torques now, how would the thing be? So we are going to have the summation of anti-clockwise torque has to be equal to the summation of clockwise torques. So how many forces are producing anti-clockwise torque? You understand that if you keep on pulling this force, it will make the rule move in an clockwise direction. So what we are going to do now, I'll take that same thing by writing it in this format f1 d1 it has to be equal to then you come to the part where you have two different forces that are making the the ladder move anti-clockwise 
I mean clockwise direction. So we have this component which is perpendicular to the, the distance from the pivot. At the same time, we also have that one. So we have two forces, meaning that those same forces, I'll write them like this. I'll say F2 D2 plus F3 D3. Now, here we only have a single force, which is N2 sine 53 multiply by the distance starting from the pivot we take this one to be our pivot why because we don't have a torque at this point that's why this can't be used when calculating for torques okay now at this instant what we are going to do i'll put my n2 sine 53 here multiply by the distance that you have from the pivot which is six I'll say six equal to f2 you can even write the one which is in the middle or you can start with the one which is at the end so if i start with the one which is in the middle the distance from here up to somewhere there we said this one which is the weight of the ladder it must have the length from here up somewhere there which is going to be half of the rule okay so i'll take this one to be n sorry m1g cos 53 multiplied by the distance which is 3 plus then the other force which is the last force it has to be this one which is perpendicular now to the length of the ladder starting from here up to where that force is we don't exactly know what that same length is going to be we label it as x so i'll say m2 g cos 53 multiplied by x we don't exactly know what that same x is going to be if we proceed we have this one which is 440 i'll multiply this by 6 and i'll say sine 53 i can do like this minus what do you have on this part m1 it has to be 20 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 10 cos 53 then equate to what you have you want to get the x the distance to which an electrician is going to do it is going to move so we're going to have 60 multiplied by 10 multiplied by x cos 53 degrees like that so it's possible you can just do this you divide throughout now by if you multiply there we're going to have 600 cos 3 cos 53 sorry and here 600 cos 5, 3. You cancel, meaning that the distance to which an electrician is going to move will be like this. So I'll do this. I'll say 440 multiplied by 6 um, sine 53. I'll close. Now subtract this by. Um, on this part, if you try to multiply this and that, you get 200. 200 multiplied by 3, we're going to 600 cos. Um, that is 53 like this we are getting that then you can divide this by 600 cos 53 you close you get something like 4.84 4 meters 4.84 4 meters that has to be the distance to which an electrician is going to move and that's how you solve this to my questions in a case whereby they're asking you to calculate for the distance that someone is going to do what he's going to move as simple as that try to follow i mean try to subscribe to the channel try to share for more videos that are coming thank you